Is that a uh, matcha? It's <laughs> it's coffee. It's, oh, it's black coffee. Oh, through a straw? Yeah, because it make, keeps my teeth white. So. Oh yeah, I have that problem myself. Yeah. You mean coffee stains your teeth, or you yeah, I have, a, I have I have a strained I have stained teeth due to all the espresso I've uh, imbibed. Oh. <laughs> I try to I try to key, color key it out, but it's not totally efficient to do so. Yeah, so you, I'm just kind of right, imperfect. You, right, exactly. It's just you know you're wearing your coffee, and you should be I, proud of it. I am. I'm proud. <laughs> I'm proud of the beans that I have exactly consumed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm still nervous. I'm just well, um, I've never done it, anything like this. Okay. Uh I did see you post at least one video. Well, I've made videos, but I, I've yeah. never done a live type oh, this, of interview. We're not live. We're not? No, I mean we're both ex existing in the same moment, but this is not being broadcast. <laughs> okay, okay. Still you I haven't like spoken to someone who was interviewing me and I've watched some of your interviews before. Yeah. And you kind of have a very open dia dialogue style where you just both kind of as you say jam. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you jam in person much? Uh <laughs> Yes, but I'm very bad at small talk. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm very good at talking about like extremely deep things that make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And are make yeah, make me seem like I'm a weirdo. Oh. Because I'm like, yeah, like someone will say, How's the weather? And I'll be like, Did you know the weather in the eighteen hundred there was a little ice age five hundred years ago or blah 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 in which the temperatures actually dropped ten degrees and half the human population suffered. Like, you know, like blah I'll go to crazy places. Yeah, yeah. Because of volcanoes yeah. in Indonesia. <laughs> Krakatoa or something. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much schooling did you have you done so far? Um, about the eighth grade. Oh. <laughs> and then you just uh, start working on a paper route. <laughs> you had to pay for my hormones. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it was. It was actually that I switched to being homeschooled in in ninth grade. And didn't receive the best education in that homeschooling. So essentially I say that my last real education was eighth grade, <laughs> the last real education I was receiving. And yeah. sorry if you hear my cat hissing at my dog. Oh, okay. Dogs and cats. Okay, cool. Yeah. Do you have a, goldfish. is there, is there gonna, oh, goldfish? And rat. And <laughs> rat? Is there a canary gonna fly into your hair? <laughs> Well, I used to have chickens <laughs> in oh, my house. <laughs> okay, so you're you're edge you're like uh, Doctor Doolittle. Mm -hmm. way, just yeah. you know, not the doctor part. Just I'm a Doolittle. Hi. <laughs> okay. A menagerie. I have like a zoo in my house. Yes. Huh. <laughs> okay, that's another data point. <laughs> so, did, were you? Was this before the internet when you were homeschooled? Did you have access to? I've had access to the internet since I was five years old. Okay. I have, the internet essentially raised me, so no. <laughs> okay. I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. In what respect? If, if five, what can you do on the internet? Well, for I'm 30 years old. I was born in 92, so we got the internet in 97, dial up, and... <laughs> Essentially, I looked up Pokemon and <laughs> things like that. I and uh, didn't really do anything meaningful or anything like that. I wrote emails to my friends and stuff like that. Um, but as I got older, the internet became my main source of, I guess, socializing and learning about the world, especially once I was homeschooled. <sighs> yeah, so... That's that's what I mean by it raised me. It, yeah, yeah. It taught me most of what I know. Yeah, and you're still on it. Yes, I'm. I, unfortunately, I am. Yes, I. <laughs> I. It's it's kind of a good and a bad thing. It's the internet's a pretty crazy place. Have you learned to master it? 
<laughs> no, because I haven't learned to master myself, essentially. Oh, it's that yeah. The internet is inherently addictive to me. As in, it's just wired, it's just built to be addictive yeah. and to mess with your mind and keep you coming back, as social media specifically. Okay. So I haven't mastered my addiction to watching YouTube videos and my addiction to social media, uh, just Twitter and, and things like that. Yeah. yeah. What do you get out of it? Um, a sense, I guess what I get out of it is it, it lets me kind of into explore intellectual topics that I would never get to explore in person or in real life. Um, and it also lets me safely talk to people about my transsexualism without actually sacrificing my reputation in person. Hmm. Yeah, on social media. At what level of risk is your reputation in person? Um, well, I have always lived a rather stealth life. Stealth meaning that I don't openly talk about transgender stuff with people. And ideally, I don't want people to know that I'm transgender. So at my, my workplace, for example, I, people know because I live in a small town and I told one gentleman that I was dating and we broke up and he went and told everybody. And so people, there's a, there's the rumor that I'm trans transgender, but people don't actually know people. A lot of people think it's a fake rumor and things like that. So I don't want people to just know that I'm transgender. I don't want people to know about any of that. I'm very private in that yeah. regard. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's a set of, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say distress, but at least stress. Oh, definitely, uh, because, oh, can, can you talk? Sorry, I don't know if my uh, microphone just Too many. Okay, I hear yeah. you. <laughs> it is, it's stressful because it's trying to control what other people know about you and what they think about you. And that's impossible <laughs> to do. Yeah, yeah. It is stressful, it's stressful. And I've had people ask me, you know, I heard this rumor that someone told me you're a guy, is that true? people will come up to me and say things like that. And I'll say, Oh, that's, that's weird. <laughs> I don't really want to talk about that. That that's weird. Okay. Yeah. So I can safely, I can feel safe talking about this with you or with Twitter or with YouTube. And it takes stress off of me because okay. it is something that I think about and that affects me all the time. Me being transgender. It's a, it's a very heavy burden to carry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Before we venture that way, I, I just wonder how important are other people's opinions of you? And you're 30, so you're, <laughs> it's changing. It assumes. is. It, yeah. There are a lot less. I used to be like a chameleon who would change because I was terrified of social judgment. I was terrified how people would interpret me and and their interpretation of me was more important to I didn't have a sense a strong sense of self. Yeah. It was all based on what other people thought of me. If they thought thought I was attractive, if they thought I was nice or or if they thought I was female, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it was always extremely important to me, extremely. Yeah. But as I get older, I am I guess what is it called? Letting it all hang out a little more because YouTube, well, I don't, I don't want to get into that. Essentially, everybody has their own opinion about you. And it doesn't change who you are in any meaningful way. That's what I've learned. It, it can affect you on some level. It, we have to manage our reputation for certain things in certain ways. And a small mm -hmm. town life has more impact than a big city life because you can kind of duck and cover absolutely more yeah yeah um you said <laughs> that it was important to you that people thought you were nice and kind mm -hmm. 
and good and female. Are all those things mm-hmm. kind of together? Are, is being female being good on some level to you? Well, yes, I think so. I, I think that there's, I think there's a concept, I think it's called this, it's called the eternal feminine. And it's kind of like all the most amazing traits of the feminine, of the female in a way. And I always wanted to embody the perfect femininity, huh. the perfect gracefulness, the perfect kindness, warm, warmth, self-sacrifice, all those things, yeah. nurturing. And it was important that people thought of me as those things to me and thought of me as, as female, biological, how I saw myself. That, yeah, I, I had a very fragile, I needed people to see me. I've always wanted people to see me a very specific way almost like a perfectionist yeah and Mm -hmm. that is very very difficult to do because you can't really control other people oh i'm sorry i cut out for at the last couple words it's that's impossible to do because you can't control other people you can manipulate them you can kind of position them Mm -hmm. influence Uh, them let's say yes uh, absolutely and no, I've had to let that go a lot of it and be more my, who I, who I really am. Or I, I basically, I'm, I show my <laughs> flaws and my weirdness a lot more now than I used to. Yeah. I, yeah, I've let down some of the boundaries and the walls, things like that. I detect that your childhood was kind of, there was stress there. Um, so I'm wondering, like, did you have resources or stable adults that you could talk to to help manage this stuff? My like to help manage my childhood stress and things like that. Yeah, somebody to talk to, somebody to look up to. <sighs> I had a stable family life, as in I had two parents of the opposite sex, you know, um, a mom and a dad. And I had three siblings and yes. And I had, I was a very happy young child, but once I turned nine or 10 about, I was an emotional wreck and I didn't have anyone who understood me or who I, I didn't feel even know how to tell people things about myself. I didn't feel that sense of security and safety. So I, I did have, yeah, and I did have a pretty stressful childhood in certain ways, um, if I can go into that. If you'd like when to. I was a, yeah. a young child, when I was three, four, five, my, my parents ha- would fight v- viciously, viciously. And it was always about jealousy or my dad drinking alcohol. And so that's what I thought that was normal to have parents, your parents screaming at each other and threatening each other and things like that. And so once I got to school though, I realized, oh, that's not normal. <laughs> once I started going to kindergarten, I would tell people about, oh yeah, my, my mom held a knife to my dad. And people would be like, you're joke. People thought I was joking. And I, once I realized that people thought I was that was like me hyperbolizing or being like a, a joke. I was like, oh, that's not normal. You know, that's not right. And I don't know how to, else to go into this. I think I have an emotionally unavailable father and kind of an overly emotional mother, <laughs> huh. a neurotic mother. Okay. And it just, maybe I took on a lot of the stress of my mother where and where were you in the lineup of the kids, oldest, middle? I was the young, the youngest. You're the youngest. Okay. I was a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and how old is the oldest? She is 16 years older than me. Um, okay. Wow, that's when, quite a story. Yes. <laughs> she was born in '76, and um, she's my half sister, my mom's. Um, and my mom had me at almost 40. She was almost 40, so I was the last born. Yeah. Yeah. Were they around growing up, your other siblings? Um, my sister moved to Florida. My oldest sister, my 16 years older sister, moved to Florida when I was three or four. 
and I was I was from Pennsylvania, so no, not her. Um, and my other siblings are one year older than me and two years older than me. They were both my brothers, and um, they we were like best friends. We were inseparable, like the Three Musketeers. We were. Yeah. How did <laughs> we they three boys. deal with the stress of your parents' disharmony? I have no, I have no idea. I really don't. Um, they both seemed a lot more stable than me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they like by the age of eight or nine, I was already having almost like crying my eyes out. I was always a crybaby, <laughs> but starting at like fifth grade, I was begging my parents, please don't make me go to school. Please don't make me go to school. I can't take it. Like I was just the stress of everything was too much for me. And I would bur cry my eyes out and scream and cry. And my siblings didn't have anything like that. They were more just like, oh, school, whatever. Was it uh, overstimulating? Were there bullies? Did you not get along? Was it just too much stuff to process for you? It was. Sorry if you hear my dog chewing on a bottle. Do you That's hear fine. that? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, thank you. It was. Okay, maybe, it was maybe more... we should take the bottle away. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you mind if I do? Yeah. You can cut yeah. this out? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can edit. it. <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. Hmm. Bad marker. Cool. Okay. Let's hope she doesn't find something else. Uh, she'll find something else. She's a bit <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, I think she already did. Um, sorry, annoying. But um, you asked me a uh, school. I I didn't like being. I was not popular. Okay. <sighs> Benjamin, I am so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We'll roll with it. Gracie, come here. I'll get the other one. Give me a sec. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope I, she might find another one. Okay. If we have to reschedule, I, I understand. But um. <laughs> okay. So you asked me about school. Why it was stressful for me? Um, it was because I um. I was not popular. I was kind of seen as like a quiet, I don't know, loser maybe. Yeah. And yeah, I just, I was very scared of all social judgment. Like I definitely distorted, co what do they call it? Cognitive distortions. I kind of thought everybody hated me and that all the, I was scared of teachers. I was scared of their judgment. I was scared of, I like if the, if kids had to pick a partner, no one would pick me. And people would like, people sometimes would pick me cause they felt bad for me. They would say like, I, I feel bad for him. You know, can he be in our group? You know, I feel bad that he's all alone. Yeah. Yeah. That was hard. And this is in um, the turn of the century, turn of the millennium, <laughs> 2000. Let me think. So. 2001. Okay. 2002. That, yeah. And how big was uh, this uh, the school that you grew up in uh, or you went to at that time? Well, my parents moved us to a, in third grade, my parents moved us to a, I'll say a lower quality school public school um and it was it was like 30 percent illegal immigrants oh who did who barely spoke any english okay and that just was a culture shock to me um and it was it was a pre the classrooms had like 35 kids in them okay well my previous school had like 15 kids in them yeah yeah, yeah. and what happened it was that eight nine is that what yeah. sparked the the sudden burst of emotionality or, or disturbance yes that was i don't know if it was just growing up and becoming more self-aware of my place in kind of like the social hierarchy 
or if it was actually just being uprooted and feeling like I lost my my sense of community and self. Yeah. And was there any school psychologist or I guess even? Yes, actually. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no. Yeah. So in fourth grade, I, I made a complete joke. It was a joke. I made a uh -oh. joke at the lunch table. Yes, yeah, so, uh -oh. <laughs> that's right. Um, I made a joke and this was very soon after 9-11. In Columbine, I right? made a joke. <laughs> yes, in Columbine. Letter, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, Columbine was, was the 90s actually. Um, yeah. This was in like 2001, 2002. I made a joke that I wanted to bomb an island and turn it into Teddy Bear Island. Like it was some stupid thing like that. Okay, all right. <laughs> I didn't have a concept of what a bomb, like what that meant. It was kind of, I was trying to be more like funny. I was, I was weird. So I want to like, yeah. And then, so all the kids went to their parents and said, there's this kid at school who wants to bomb things. Jesus, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the next day, this, the counselor or psychologist called us all to the office. And I, that also made me feel like I was went like, I felt so weird. Like, oh my goodness. Am I like a bad person? Am I a bad kid? That they're, you know, making me go to a counselor and psychologist and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys have a church community or any other kind of community? <laughs> I, well, yes, I went to CCD. If it's like a, a Catholic, I don't know what it stands for, but it's essentially Catholic education once a week on Mondays. I would go after school. Um, and occasionally I would go to confession. I, I had all the sacraments. And so yeah. there was, there wasn't a sense of community. It was more of a sense of like, I had strong bonds with my siblings and my mom and dad. Yeah. What yeah. was the uh, impact of uh, Catholicism on your imagination and your psychology? <laughs> At what age? Just growing up? Yeah, just growing up. And then <laughs> and then how did it change over time? Well, I loved God. I love like I, I I was so happy. I loved God. I felt safe. Hmm. I felt like I'm gonna you know, when I die I'll go to heaven. Um and stuff like that. But as I got older, um it was more of about about when I started to realize I was um gay. I mean, I don't identify as gay now, but when I started to realize that I was interested in boys, that was when I really started to see God and like God would punish me. Or it was just, you know, I prayed to God all the time saying, like, please don't make me gay. Yeah. Please don't, please let me be straight and all that. Like, I don't want to be gay. And yeah. So as I got, and then at a certain point, I became an edgy atheist, an edgy atheist teenager. So at like 14, I was like, God's not real. He's a man in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> you started quoting, uh, what, Daniel Dennis, <laughs> Chris Hitchens. Or, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or who's that other gentleman? Um, who, uh, Richard. Uh, Dawkins. Oh, I, Dawkins. Yes, yeah, I would. Yeah. I would. Yes, Richard Dawkins. I would say, I'd say to my mom, mom, God's just, you know, like Santa Claus. <laughs> And I'm the one who knows everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so edgy 14 year old Reddit atheist type. <laughs> then? It was pre Reddit, but yes, just edgy, like edgy atheist. Screw you, mom. Okay. <laughs> was it was it a crisis of faith? I guess with the wrestling with your sexuality, there's. Um. No, I don't think so. I genuinely think that I. Uh, well, I don't, I, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Maybe the fact that I couldn't believe that God would let me be gay. Like, why would he let that happen if it's wrong? Um, I didn't, that was probably something I didn't understand, but around that age, I already was starting to grow away from believing in a specific God. It was already starting to seem illogical to yeah. me. Okay. Like, 14. So you're in homeschool at this time. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Beginning of ninth, ninth grade. Okay. And why were you taken out and put in homeschool? <laughs> so was there another island getting bombed? <laughs> no, please don't go there. <laughs> no, <I> um, <laughs> a little triggered right now. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. No. So in in eighth grade, I was starting to get bullied by one person, but. I don't, he was boy more like girl? my frenemy. Boy, boy, okay, yeah. He was more like my frenemy. He was like, he always wanted to hang out with me because he was lonely. Yeah. But he also would say, you know, everybody thinks you're the gayest kid in the school. You know that, right? Yeah. And he would hit me over the head in a joking way. And I was a pushover. I was a total pushover. Okay, yeah. I would just like laugh. I'd be like, <laughs> that was so funny that you just hit me over the head. And he was like way bigger than me. I was very short and petite and small because I was. Hmm. Um, and so he Did he would bring up the gay say, thing or did you bring up the gay thing? I didn't even like really come to, I didn't even like know if I was actually gay at that point. Okay. Like I didn't think, it wasn't like a part of my identity. Like I was just, I knew I liked boys, but I was like kind of still quite, like being like, maybe compartmentalizing they call it. or. Okay. <laughs> and so no, he didn't know anything. But I was terrified people would just know. They would know that I was gay. Um, but so when he started to say, you know, everyone, he was on the baseball team. So he said, you know, in the locker room, we were talking about who's the gayest kid in the school. And we all said it was you. That's what he would say to me, things like that. And so I ran away from home for one day. Okay. <laughs> the day after that, um, because I was so shattered. And so scared because it that kind of forced me to come to terms with it too. Like he was calling me gay and I, I realized there was truth to that. That's why it hurt so much. And so it, I came back anyway, I finished out eighth grade. And then in over the summer, I realized, that's when I really started to realize the transgender thing. So I, didn't want to go back to school because one, I was afraid of social judgment. And two, I wanted to transition without anyone, without school. I wanted to kind of maybe in a, almost like a cocoon or a bubble. I wanted to transition in a bubble. And I idealized going back to school in a couple of years as a girl. Yeah. And when, where did that thought come from? Transgender one? Yeah, transgender. Just in general? Yeah. Um, well, this is a little hackneyed, but it's true that in most cases, I started feeling weird about my gender when I was four. Okay. As in, I would put on dresses. Like, my mom would let me try put on her dresses, and she didn't care. She was very, like, whatever. <laughs> and um, I would play Super Mario, and I really wanted to be the princess. <laughs> I really wanted to be Princess Peach and I wanted a pink dress and I would fantasize about things like that. Okay. And at four or five, so six. Four. It was really at four. It was before I started going to school and realizing that that was weird. Okay. Um, and these are very vivid emotions and memories for you. Yes. Like it felt so amazing to think of myself as being Princess Peach. Okay. Why? No, you can't. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think I lo wanted to, I, maybe I really just, I don't know. I, it was to seem nice to be like rescued by a prince and be, or rather oh. rescued by a Mario <laughs> or just rescued by a guy and be the one who's being protected and stuff like that. I'm yeah. Your brother's rather masculine, manly man. No. No. Nerdy? No, I have, <laughs> I have two brothers, and frankly, one of them transitioned to be a woman, too. Oh. Yes. Uh, and the other one is, I don't know. He is not gay, and he's not transgender. He's more like asexual. Yeah. <sighs> That's um, statistically... <laughs> unlikely Anomalous. outside of uh, <laughs> outside of like woke the woke thing that's going on now 
Yeah, I agree. You look stunned. <laughs> it's it's anomalous. It's weird. It's crazy. Trust me. I. It's yeah. It's crazy. It's, Are you close with your transgender brother? I don't know. We're, well, we're, I call gonna, her my sister. But yeah, we're gonna butcher all the uh, gender. Things <laughs> Okay. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, yes, we are close. Um, you know, we've had some drama in our lives because I don't mean to be rude, but she is not as passable as me. Oh. As in, she really went through puberty early and masculinized early and never was able to, I guess, look as feminine as me. So that creates tension yeah even even if you won't say admit it it's yeah. clear tension and but we're now at 30 and 31 and 32 we are all very close oh good again okay yeah was your sister's thoughts and journey similar to you like very early onset kind of idealization of the feminine or desire to embody that <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, she will, we all like, liked to put on dresses and be silly with each other when we were very young, you know, four or five, but she was very masculine, um, kind of more of like the, like karate and like power Rangers and kind of like, would like say like, I'm going to punch you if you don't stop being mean to me and just kind of more masculine and boyish. And I was more of the, one who loved flowers and teapots and okay yeah. <laughs> snow white kind of, singing to the birds kind of thing <laughs> i was very uh yes i was the one <laughs> who liked things like the little mermaid and <laughs> yeah things like that I, um I, I i i hesitate going down the path of talking about a third person um it just seems like what comes to mind and I don't know how accurate this is, but there's this mm -hmm. brilliant researcher, sexologist, Ray Blanchard, and he has a typology yes. for uh, mm -hmm. transgender, specifically male to female. And there's the homosexual, transsexual, and then the autogynophile, the, the man, the heterosexual man who desires to embody the feminine and then the homosexual male who is the sexuality component is not in possessing the woman mm -hmm. it's rather being the woman because it makes more sense in the world mm -hmm. but i don't want i want to it just my intuition says that there's probably a little bit of difference in the motivations between you and your brother in transition but um i'll if, if i if you don't mind me talking about a third person i don't okay. mind um no we are actually both more of the homosexual, transsexual. Okay. Yes. Both exclusively like males, men. Okay. Um, and not the autogynophilia. Okay. And yeah. your your older brother or the other brother homosexual? <laughs> he isn't a homosexual, no. Okay. I you don't said think asexual. I've, okay. He has, he's 32 and he's never shown any interest in anything sexual ever. Since, truly, like he's not even insecure about it. Okay. He's just like, nope, not interested. Okay. <laughs> in, even in uh, relationships. And I'm, I really, I apologize for speaking about your family or inquiring about your family. It just seems <laughs> it, it, statistically I think it's anomalous. Um, I'm sorry, you asked something about him. He's not even relationships. No, I okay. think, I think as he gets older, he wants to have children. Um, but I don't know. I don't think he's really that interested in building a, a life with somebody. Yeah. yeah. So at 14, mm -hmm. you get outed in this weird way you decide to transition how so did you find media about that or mm -hmm. did the thought yeah okay so how where did you discover the process was possible 
Well, it's kind of a, it's not a long story, but certain events were the linchpins that triggered it. Um, so in eighth grade, when I was 13, first of all, I was already a total, like, very feminine person. I loved, like, America's Next Top Model and tw- when I was 12. I liked to pose for pictures and pretend like I was a model. Hmm. And, um, and uh, things like that. And then by eighth grade, people actually started to think I was a girl because um, I had grown my hair very long. Um, and, like, people would say, there's a girl in the boys' locker room. <laughs> and, uh, and once a boy, like, actually touched my leg in gym class, like, ran his hand up my leg because he thought I was a girl. Um, and that was disgusting. I'm just saying that was something that was weird that happened to me. That that uh, touch was not desired, wanted, and it didn't feel. No, 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 no. I, it was literally, I was sitting in gym class, like with all the other kids and suddenly my friend says, dude, look at your leg. And there was a, a gentleman who was, um, like uh, an older guy. uh, well, uh, an eighth grader, but like, yeah. he was like much bigger than me and like had, you know, he was more developed than me. And, um, it was in front of everybody. Like I didn't, you know, no, I didn't want that. Oh, that's, okay. Yeah. So that's another thing. Um, and, uh, and then by the end of that year, I had been begun to be mistaken for a girl all the time. And I realized that I liked it. Yeah. Um, and so one day in the, in the summer before ninth grade, when I had turned, just turned 14, my friend and I went to like a kid's house and his sister said, who is she about me? <laughs> who is she? Why do you bring her here? And <laughs> so I, I realized that, and then my friend was like, that's a boy. And she, it was so embarrassing, but I realized I would have preferred that he didn't correct her. And she just thought, carried on thinking I was female. And so I went online and I looked up how to stop puberty. I didn't look up transgender. I looked up how to stop puberty because I thought in a magical way, maybe I could stop puberty. Maybe I could just be young and beautiful and feminine forever. And so I found something about puberty blockers and that led to transgender stuff that you know they use puberty blockers and transgender people and spironolactone is what the medicine would be called or androcur and so i thought i'm gonna i need this i need this testosterone blocker like i need it and so that november i took my mom's credit card and i ordered (laughs) Spironolactone 100 milligrams from a UK based pharmacy website that didn't, you don't need, didn't need a prescription for. Okay. Yeah. This was in 2006. And I, my mom caught me and I told her all that. And I said, can I get, um, can I, can I please get castrated? Can I please, can you please bring me to a doctor who will, you know, neuter me? And, you know, she was just like, oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, my stars. I I need to tell your father you said that. And (laughs) that was her reaction and stuff like that. And so I told her, okay, mom, I'll I'll make sure to send the pills back when I get them. Sorry about that. But I didn't. (laughs) And I started taking spironolacto, anti-androgens in that November of 2006. How old were you? 14. 14. I was 14 so and a, how how 14 and a half. how far did the puberty start? At um that point? well my voice had dropped a little bit. Like n- I mean not like a lot. Um and I definitely had an Adam's apple slight like you can see it and I definitely got some brow ridge bossing on my brow ridge but um I was still very Like, I have very small hands. I was still very petite. I thought, like, small shoulders. Acne? Anything like that? (laughs) 
Um, yes, acne too. Okay. Like my testosterone, had, it had definitely started to kick in. Okay. I probably started puberty at like 12, but it, okay. like, yeah. And what was the experience of the anti-androgen? Did you feel it? Or did you feel the lack? Or what was it? I'll be honest, Benjamin. Um, it's, I am old. I am 30, a 30 year old boomer. And it is hard for me to remember. <laughs> okay. But I don't remember. Maybe it killed my sex drive or okay. something. I don't, I don't even remember. Were you close yeah. to girls at all in school when you were still going to school? No. 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 It mesh, not at all. No, like besties or anything like that. Well, when I was very young, let's say kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, I was friends with girls. Like we would all, you know, hang out together and talk about, you know, how much we like certain things and <laughs> stuff like that. Like, and then, but I was also friends with boys, but my best friends were girls. And, but w once I'd say fourth grade, fifth grade hit, actually it's like once we started to get told we were different. Yeah. I felt weird around girls. I felt like maybe something like I was supposed to be, maybe that they had kind of separated us and told us that boys kind of get I don't know how to explain this. Maybe I felt kind of like I wasn't, it, I shouldn't be around girls anymore because we're different. We're like, I'm going to develop this way. You're going to develop this way. And maybe I, I felt like I was expected to like be like girls in a more romantic or sexual way. And I, yeah. So <laughs> I kind of distanced myself. Okay. Yeah. So it's one thing to be a woman. It's another thing to become a woman. Mm -hmm. So once you, and then it's one thing to be a man and it's another thing to not be a man. So putting a pause on puberty is not becoming a man. It's not necessarily becoming a woman. There's kind of two different things, right? So, and when we first began speaking, you spoke about the, uh, there's an ideal, a feminine ideal. So you have a concept of mm -hmm. it. So what's the, um, the path for you pausing things and then approaching womanhood? Mm -hmm. Cause you have to do it intentionally. Um, the body's not going to yes. do it for you. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, frankly, I, Benjamin, I, I left something out. Um, when I learned about puberty blockers, I also at the same time learned about transgender stuff from like transgender forums, forums. Like I think there was one called Susan's Place and there was a website called secondtypewoman.com. Huh. Um, and I, so I immediately knew I was, wanted to be a girl, a, a woman, a girl. I, it didn't, I never thought I want to pause puberty and then later figured out I want to be a girl. It's when I started to look up stopping puberty, I realized I don't want to stop puberty so I can be a kid forever. I want to stop puberty because I want people to th mistaken me for a girl forever. That's what I mean. I don't, didn't okay. want it to, I wanted that forever. Yeah. Um, so it was the dis, and I'll go back when I was eight years, eight years old, I asked my mom if I could grow my hair long, get my ears pierced, dress in girls clothes, be a girl. Like I just, yeah, like it, it goes back all my whole life. Okay. What was her reaction to date? What was her reaction? Yeah. Oh, she said, Oh, sweetheart, you know, boys can be pretty too. Huh. You know, boys, boys can be pretty too, sweetheart. That's what she said, which is kind of like a sweet sentiment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you speak of your mother's voice, <laughs> oh, in no. your mother's voice, it sounds like she's talking to a girl. So I'm wondering, <laughs> does she treat you that way or are you? Well, my yes. <laughs> my mother is so soft and so feminine. Hmm. Like not like in a way like wearing makeup and like dresses and things like that. I mean like so nurturing yeah. and sweet and soft. 
and sometimes a little crazy, but mostly sweet and soft, that she would talk to me like, oh, sweetheart, you know, you can be a pretty boy too, you know, like that. Yeah. So yeah, there probably was a sort of feminine, fem treating me in, a, in an almost feminine way. And your father? How His did reaction? he? Yeah, how did he process? He didn't, he didn't, my mom didn't tell him, I don't think. And if he did, if she did tell him, I have no idea. But like I said, my dad was rather, um, he was very sweet. Like he would say like, I love you guys. And he would want us to be safe and he would spoil us and buy us whatever we wanted. But he wasn't, he wouldn't talk about things openly like that. Like, you know, in a, in a productive way. Like, so you're trying like, so you told your mom you want to be a girl. Like he would never say anything like that. He probably just wouldn't bring it up. Okay. <sighs> yeah. What about being a man? Did he take you guys out and, okay, <laughs> we're going to do this thing. We're going to kill something <laughs> and you're going to be a boy and I'll tell you what it means. Yeah. Oh, so that, that's what being a man is. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, um, <laughs> If that's a being a man is no, I know what you mean. Uh, no, he definitely did not instill any, any masculinity in me. Okay. Any. Well, uh, what about virtue? Uh, did he teach you guys lessons, discipline? You know, like this is how to behave discipline. in the world? Okay. Well, like, you know, if I was caught lying, I'd have to, you know, maybe I, I got spanked a handful of times in my entire life, yeah. but more like I'd have to sit in the timeout chair or I'd have to go to my room. You know, we were taught I to be generally good people. Like I, we were taught to be good people and be kind to people, be kind to animals, you know, um, things like that, be nice, but maybe a little too nice, <laughs> maybe a little, no, I was never made to do manual labor, like in any way, like, I don't mean like, you know, anything bad. I just mean like anything. I was treated very delicately. Huh. Were you expected life. to get a job at some point? Like No. Okay. I wasn't. My, in fact, to this day, my parents wouldn't care if I lived in their basement and did okay. nothing. But, but they, <laughs> that's very loving of them and generous. <laughs> well, it's loving on one hand, but if I watched a lot of Jordan Peterson and yeah. they essentially let me be an, would let me be an adolescent to the day I die. Okay. So it's loving, but it's kind of the road to hell is paved with good intentions so, type and loving. Is that kind of reflected in what you were talking about, about homeschool? Like you weren't, they didn't really demand no, performance. Nothing. Okay. Nothing, honestly. Um, and I, I'm not trying to denigrate them. It's just like, I love my parents. It's just, they, my dad tried a little the first year, but they both worked full time. My dad was working 70 hours a week. My mom was working 40 hours a week. Really? Yes. He ran what? like a, he was like a trucker kind, okay. kind of. Um, and so they didn't have time to really devote to me and my, um, yeah, me. And the, so in ninth grade, there was a little bit of education from my father, a little bit following the curriculum. But frankly, past ninth grade, I genuinely didn't get an education. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What did you do with your time? Build forts, <laughs> doll, doll houses? Forts. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing productive. I like mm -hmm. I said, I spent all day on the computer. Okay. The computer. Oh, I watched a lot of a lot of Charmed, and if you know the show Charmed, I watched a lot of um, daytime television, which is awful, by the way. It has always oh, been awful. And okay. This yeah. is before and, YouTube, um, so you didn't have access to all the awesome <laughs> YouTube no, it, content. YouTube came out when I was in eighth grade, so I was okay. still so it's not technically not. Um, but By no, that I time, would like have all... ten minute videos and a lot of it was really meme <laughs> and punchy, humorous kind of stuff. It wasn't <laughs> the serious stuff that we have now, right? No, it wasn't serious at all. It was very. It was like I made YouTube videos actually. Like oh, you can really? still see some. <laughs> really? Yes. I'm gonna have to. You're gonna have to send me a link later on. I will. I will. <laughs> um, but I made a. Yeah. I. I, what were I you made doing? a video like playing was, Minecraft and. 
I'm 30, Benjamin. Oh, I know. No Minecraft. Okay. <laughs> well, what would you do in a YouTube video? Like, well, actually, I made a video called "I Am a Transgender Teenager," and oh. that's gone. That's gone. That I deleted that, but it got Good. like 20,000 views in a. I deleted it back in 2006, but it got like 20,000 views in one week, and I just couldn't. I was my my brother found it, and he was like, "I'm gonna go tell dad," so I deleted it. Okay. Um, and so. Oh wow. Oh wow! Can um, we can we can we can we uh, can, can we zero in on that? <laughs> yes. So this is two thousand what eight? You said six two thousand six. I was fourteen. This was all like fourteen. Okay, two thousand six. So, um, over the past ten years, uh, trans influencers, especially teen trans influencers, have gotten really big and actually mm -hmm. really rich off of the attention. How do you think that would have affected you if you can put yourself back in that f place too? just get attention and power and yeah. You know. do, do you mean if I existed in, in the past 10, if I was a teenager in the yeah, past 10 years? Yeah, like, if you just like fast forward five years and you posted that video and it gets 100,000 views and a you know, book deal or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that, like, would I have done gone through with that? Do you mean? Like, yeah, well, how do you, been... okay, well, if, would you have embraced that? And how do you think it would have affected you to, to do a public uh, transition? Yes, I do think I would have embraced it. And I think it would have put a lot of pressure on me. Um, maybe a too... No, I actually don't know how to say this. Hmm. It probably just would have screwed with my sense of... I would have felt too much judgment. That's, that's probably the thing that would really have disaffected me just even affirmative even if it was like super affirmative um that i would have liked that at the time um but i don't know it just it would have just been too much attention for me to actually develop like in a self-actualizing way <sighs> i kind of needed to go through Something more lo lonely. Yeah. I think. I don't know if that's a good answer. It's just, I don't know how it would have affect dis affected me or disaffected me. Just, w it would have been weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, even my tiny YouTube channel now freaks me out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you had one bottle of the magic pill. <laughs> Which stops stops the boyness. It doesn't start the girlness, though. Correct. Right. Correct. You need mm -hmm. the you need the oestrogen. Y yes. So how and do you get more okay. puberty blockers? How do you get estrogen? Well, how, what, what, how do you do this? And then how do you convince your parents? Well, blah, blah. so continue with the story. <laughs> okay, let's let's unpack this story. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> let's let's talk about it. Um, so I would get things like money for Christmas and um, money for my birthdays. And I'd ask for a visa prepaid gift card always. And that's, you could, I could use it on the, the pharmacy website, wow. you know, by pharmacy, I mean, illegal stuff. <laughs> but um, I, so I would keep ordering stuff and like my dad would be like, you're not taking those pills still. Cause he, we, it's a long story. Like basically everybody learned of it in my house and I'd be like, no, 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 I'm not transgender anymore. No. And even though you're becoming more and more womanly. No, I, at that point I was just stunting my growth. Okay. I was getting taller, but I wasn't getting bigger and broader mm -hmm. in yeah. like a traditional masculine way. And what if your aesthetic your clothes dress? Uh, I didn't care about clothes, frankly. Okay. I okay. just dressed very androgynously. I okay. would wear like a sweater and jeans and sneakers okay. and have long hair. Yeah. Um, so I continued to do that until I was 15. And then I ordered estrogen. Yeah. Just you can get on the internet and get some estrogen yes. in your pocket? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. I've had people actually accuse me of making that, like, you can't, that's ridiculous. You can't get pills like that online. But I'm like, um, okay, you know, look it up. <laughs> you still can to this day very easily. 
Am I? Yeah. And so then I started taking estrogen and I don't want to get too graphic, but I started to develop breasts Yeah. and my skin started to look very, um, I don't want to say translucent, but just that feminine, yeah. the first, the, the first thing you notice is you, your skin, you know, first of all, no acne anymore and just a more translucent quality to the skin. Um, and yeah, so at that point, I actually told my mom, mom, I'm starting to develop gynecomastia, I think it's called. And I did that so she wouldn't know. So you're not educated, but you're clever as fuck. <laughs> I manipulated him. <laughs> not huh. even like, not anymore. Like, like I, but I was, yes, I was, I would do anything to the meat, the ends justify the means. Um, very Machiavellian. No, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm here for so, it. <laughs> so then she's, you know, she like saw a news report and was like, sweetheart, I saw that that was actually normal. The boys would develop gynecomastia sometimes. And I was like, oh, phew. Thank you, mom. I was scared of that. Can and we get a bra I would now? wear, <laughs> wait, there's a, yeah, there's a story to that too. <laughs> no, I wanted, I wanted a, a training bra, but I never got one. Um, but uh, huh. yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more. And I normally don't tell people this part okay? because I don't like people knowing this about me, but you know, I really want to be honest with people and with you. And so I was taken off the hormones when my dad found out around the age of 16. And uh, that was devastating, absolutely devastating. And um, my pa my mom, we I started going to a transgender center in Philadelphia. Um, and they they didn't put me back on hormones until I was seventeen. Like they let me go a year without them. And that I definitely went through a little bit more male puberty. But I think by that point, certain things were stunted or changed that I couldn't actually achieve those high testosterone levels that I needed to actually thoroughly masculinize me in that year. But still that really sucked. <laughs> Why? It was, I wanted to just keep, keep on keeping on, keep on the transition. Um, and basically be a success what I wanted to achieve what I wanted. I okay. wanted to just feminize and be done with it. And uh, it was interrupted by a year. And so when I was 17, they put me back on puberty blockers and then they waited and then they said, we'll put you on estrogen if your parents both sign off on it. And my dad wouldn't. So I needed to wait until 18 to get put back on estrogen. Yeah. So you're upset angry like, mm, depressed depressed okay so kind of internal. and angry yeah well like i couldn't believe my father wouldn't do it i couldn't believe him like were you able because, to talk this out with him figure out his reasoning yeah kind of just he he's he would not budge it was that he did not want to be responsible if i regretted it he said he couldn't live with that hmm. that guilt and I understood that I did, but I just tried to reason that I will not regret this. Like I, I will not regret it, dad, please sign off on this. And he wouldn't, which I, to this, I, I understand. I really do understand. Have you forgiven him? Yes. Yeah. I, I think it was for what he knew he did the right thing yeah. for what he didn't know how sure I was. Like maybe uh, how how sure can a sixteen or seventeen year old be? Like, really? So yeah, I've forgiven him. What else is going in your on in your life? Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Your interests? Well, frankly, you not get a much. car, little Miata, <laughs> tear up the town. No, no, no. My parents like wouldn't teach me how to drive. My parents wouldn't do any of that. Huh. Um, they liked you yeah. close to the nest. 
Yeah, I think so. Like the kind of um, ex an adolescent forever, maybe. Yeah. Or like, yeah. So I didn't really do anything. I was like a shut in, genuinely like a shut in from 14 to 19 who would only talk to people on MSN Messenger. And I would go on webcam sites and do things that I regret. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't healthy. It wasn't, it just was, it was a dark time. Yeah. And that, that's a really dangerous place to be. I'm sorry, it cut out. What do you say? That's a, that's a dangerous place to be. Uh, vulnerable, yeah, yeah. online, strangers, groomers, stuff like that. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I was definitely, um, you know, approached by groomers a lot. And, you know, I was just, as they say, idle hands are the devil's plaything. Mm. And I was always idle. My hands were always idle. Yeah. Yeah. And what were you, what about like ambition were you just having fun was there any sense of becoming someone other than becoming a woman like like yeah. who are you beyond trans or well it was <sighs> i had a lot of magical thinking i thought of things almost in a magical unrealistic way um that i really i wanted to become like a successful woman like i wanted to have like a job i wanted to have like a normal life like live in an apartment like i wanted to be i was i wanted to be independent but i didn't ever think of how i would get there i didn't act, i couldn't actually like think of all the self-actualization it would take to get to that point of independence and everything so i wanted it but i didn't ever think how can i get to this point in a realistic way yeah. Well, I mean, you're 16, 17. Who has an idea of future? I mean, the things that I thought I could do and the things that I could <laughs> do are totally different. Yeah. But. Now look at you. You're like interviewing people, interesting people. It's like, what? Jeez. I know. <laughs> I've fallen so far from being a failed novelist. I, I didn't know that part, but. <laughs> Were you but, creative? Yeah, Were you artistic? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Wait, I, I stories, don't wanna, I don't poems. Talk about no, you, yeah, just be I, honest about who you were. <laughs> Drawings. Yeah, I. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, I loved writing. <laughs> I loved writing comedy stories. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and, and I loved writing fanfics, but that were like mocking people. Kind of like <laughs> people would write like really serious fan fictions about like, you know, <laughs> um. Harry Potter fanfics, like they would write like really serious, like shipping two characters. And I would write like mocking, scathing, <laughs> making fun of those people. Yeah. Um, and I would also write, I love to troll. I think that's a create, I, trolling is creative. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> I loved to write long reviews thing on things and write funny things like reviews negatively reviewing things and <laughs> like on yelp saying, or amazon or <laughs> yes <Really? laughs> and, on, um, mm -hmm. and on like imdb if you know what that is like i would write i would always be a concerned parent and i would say i <laughs> like i am when i caught my child watching you know, this anime, this Japanese cartoon, I immediately unplugged the television and told him to pray to God for forgiveness. <laughs> and uh, I would just love, I loved writing things like that. <laughs> and um, I also made music and I still make music to this day. What kind? Not like singing or anything. I suck at singing. Um, but I like video game music or like just like, not classical music, but just I like melodies. I like I like beautiful melodies. Okay. Yeah, so I still just make like little simple melodies and stuff. And I also did like to draw. Yeah. And stuff like that. <laughs> and I was just a very open. Openness is correlated directly with creativity in a way. And I'm extremely open. Like I want to know everything about everything. Yeah. So that's how, that's creative in a way, yeah. So, Very yeah, much I'm, so. I'm, I'm 
I'm I'm creative. Yeah. <laughs> so you 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 got paused for two years. It sounds like, or you you were off the well, blockers for a year, and then off estrogen for two. Well, yes, yes, you're correct. Okay. Um, but I, the puberty blockers were, that was good. Like, as long as you kept me on those puberty blockers, and I didn't grow facial hair, or if I, I didn't develop that stuff, like that my brother, like my older brother had like a beard, and I, I didn't want facial hair. So as long as I was, you know, stopping that further development, I was happy. Like, I, I wasn't happy, but I was kind of in purgatory. I wasn't happy or I was like, okay, I'm, I want the estrogen, but I'm okay. Just one more year. Yeah. And at 18 or 19, you got 18. back on the path. 18. As soon as I turned 18. Okay. Um, yeah. And Still living with your parents? Yes. And they were, they're fine with that they didn't say my house my rules well right they like i said my parents don't exactly know how to okay that sounds mean they they probably did love me and still love me very much they just didn't they would never have kicked me out or anything for any reason um and so it was more that they accepted it my dad waited until i was 18 i was an adult if i wanted to do it my choice yeah and or if he had thoughts about it, he didn't tell me. And um, at that point, I went through a severe depression once they put me back on the estrogen. Severe depression. Yeah. Um, because I thought that I couldn't pass. I thought that I will never be able to live what I, how I wanted to. Um, I wanted to be that, that teenage success story where I transitioned to 14 and just started that female puberty, at, female puberty at 14 and just, you know, forged my path. But now I was, I was 18, just being, just getting back on estrogen. And I, the estrogen made me unbelievably emotional, <laughs> like a wreck. Yeah. And then... I, the fact that I thought I had cut my hair really short, I'll be honest. I had cut my hair off all of it when I turned 17 because my oldest sister said she didn't want me looking like a girl at her wedding. Oh. And so I felt pressured and I cut off all my hair. And so generally people just thought I was, I guess, a boy again. Like I had kind of lived as an androgynous person just going out to the grocery store. People kind of thought I was a girl. And so anyway, sorry, I'm like going back and forth, but it, so I fell into a severe depression. Uh, and then around the halfway point of being six months after starting hormones, the estrogen again, rather, um, I started to be told that I was like in the wrong bathroom. Like if I was in the men's room, they'd be like, uh, are you sure you're in the right bathroom? <laughs> and if I asked people, well, hey, excuse me, can you point me into the bathroom? They'd say, the ladies' room is that way. And if I went with my mom to JC Penney's, people would say, oh, how are you ladies today? So then I was like, oh, wait a second. I'm dressing in androgynous boy clothes and my hair is still relatively short and people are still calling me a girl. And then my depression went away instantly, like overnight. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, um, I'm not you. <laughs> like the, the power of other people perceiving you, that's a precarious place to be because you can't control it and you're at their mercy. And so, you, but you slotted back into a place where they saw you how you wanted and mm -hmm. how do you, I guess, develop beyond having the locus of control in other people's perception? Like, people have so much power over you, right? If you end up oh, in a relationship, yes. when you do mm, end up I in did. a relationship. 
Oh, sorry. Well, I, well, I'm engaged. I'm engaged right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so well. I know you're talking about the past, though. Yes, I um, it, I was at their mercy, absolutely, absolutely, and that was brutal. It really was devastating. Like I tried to work. I tried to be a server at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> I tried to, you know, work at Kohl's, the clothing store. And um, if essentially if a customer was mean to me or just not nice, I like it would change my entire view of myself to the mm -hmm. point that I couldn't stop thinking about. I can't believe they treated me like that. Like, am I that worthless? And so it wasn't just to do with gender. It was just my entire person yeah. and gender was one facet of that shaky sense of self and gender probably gave me a sense of control in a way that i could control people's perception of me not in some narcissistic way just in a in a comforting way that i could get them to see me how i wanted to be seen at the time yeah. um and yeah, so, and then I did get into a relationship, <laughs> and that's a whole other story. Your first one? Time. Yes, my first relationship I got into when I was 20, and essentially he was someone who showered me with love very quickly. They call it love bombing. <laughs> okay. And I fell hook, line, and sinker for that, kind of. Um, like no one had ever treated me so i don't even know how to say it almost like worshiped me and loved me and so complimentary of me and said they wait they do anything for me and i couldn't believe that someone treated me like that i couldn't believe it like i was like me <laughs> like you'll treat me like that mm -hmm. and uh so i fell into that relationship um, we met online, but we kind of I went out, flew out to Arizona to live with him. And like, it was a very toxic relationship um, because I didn't know how to express myself. And I, if he, if he annoyed me, I wouldn't tell him anything. <laughs> I would just keep it inside. When and then like after a week, I, I would explode at him. Hmm. And yeah, and then. I'll just skip ahead. After two years together, he became physically abusive. And I never thought I would be the type of person who would allow myself to be abused ever. Like I knew I would never be that person. And I let myself be abused because I thought I loved him. You know, that's, it just, it, the whole, like I was a very, maybe I didn't, I couldn't set boundaries. I was fragile. I was, I was, weak yeah no i n had never self-actualized other than being a woman woman <laughs> um, hmm. yeah and how did you get out of that um when i was 25 my transgender sister told me something she said she broke down crying. She invited me over to her and her, her friend's apartment and she broke down crying. And she said, for five, for the past four years, um, your, I don't want to say his name. We'll just say Bob. Bob and I have been having kind of like an affair. And I haven't done it. She told me she has, she stopped it like a year ago, but you know, she needed to tell me that he's a monster. And it's funny that I was, I immediately broke up with him and, and just, I was done. Cause it's funny how I would, I wouldn't let someone cheat on me, but I would let someone hit me. But yeah. Huh. So yeah, it, it felt, it broke apart. I was done. I, I couldn't handle it. Yeah. How did you respond yeah. to the breakup? Um, how did you work through that? Well, I became severely suicidal. 
Hmm. It took a good couple months after for it to really set in. But it first stopped where I couldn't sleep anymore. I couldn't. I didn't want to eat anything. I didn't even care to take my hormones. I just started to fall apart as a human being. <laughs> and yeah. I also, my parents were moving and I didn't have a place to stay. So I was moving with my parents to another state at 25 years old. And I, I was almost, I don't want to, I don't even know the word for it, crazy. I was sticking my fingers in my ears, counting one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and crying. And, ooh, my earbud fell out. <laughs> and um, it got to a point where after we moved to another state, I was like not eating, not taking my hormones, couldn't sleep. And I was just in a corner covering myself with a blanket, shaking, because I knew that I probably was going to unalive myself. And so I did try kind of to unalive myself um, with Benadryl. Like I took like 15 pills or something. Okay. It just made me very like, actually it didn't make me, <laughs> I didn't die, I don't think, but I, <laughs> <laughs> it matrix. made. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's like where Andrew Tate is being held and stuff. No, um, but anyway, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, what well, kind of fell into like a stupor, and I didn't feel that bad and, anymore. <laughs> and anyway, my dad called an ambulance the next day because I told them it was a cry for help. It was really a cry for help. I didn't want to die, but I, I didn't also feel like I could suffer anymore. I just. So my dad called an ambulance and I was put into an, I, what would they call it? A s adult psychiatric unit for a week. And, um, I, they put me on antipsychotic pills. Okay. Um, <laughs> and antidepressants. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, like a <laughs> extended prescription of antipsychotics and. Well, oh. Yeah, um, go on. Well, it was more so that by the time I was admitted to the adult psychiatric unit, I had fallen into a very dilapidated mental state in which they didn't understand what I was trying to explain. Um, and they said that they thought I was, the psychiatrist said, I think you're schizoaffective, something like that, mm. schizoaffective or something. And so they put me, he put me on an antipsychotic which tranquilized me <laughs> and um that feel like prison or bliss or it was miserable because they i had not taken my hormones in a little while i had not eaten and fallen down to nearly a hundred pounds and i they wouldn't let me wear makeup or a bra or anything which really triggered my dysphoria because I assumed everyone knows that I'm not female. Everyone knows I'm not a woman. And I don't know if they actually did know. I was just in a very horrible mental state. And um, so I, they didn't understand me trying to explain that this isn't, I said, this isn't how people normally see me. This, is, this isn't me. Like this isn't, this isn't right. Like this is not how people should see me. I don't feel, I can't show my face. I, I can't be myself here. And that's why they were like, I think you're schizoaffective, something to that effect. Yeah. How long were you in there? One week. And then I turned 26 and my insurance ran out. Oh. Yeah. I think it was Obamacare or some colloquialism. <laughs> um, and um, well, I got out. And I was like, <laughs> only interested in one thing. And that was eating as much food as possible. Oh, okay. huh. <laughs> it just, I was so, I was just so like doped up, man. Like, hey, you know, <laughs> um, and I was on hormones again. I just, I wanted to be me again, feel. And um, then I, they had me see someone like a month, two weeks after. And they were, they were like, you are not, schizo effective and i don't you are just a, per, a normal person who was just really depressed and they took me off the antipsychotics and 
um, left me on the antidepressants, which saved my life. Absolutely saved my life. Yeah. How long were you on the antidepressants? Um, maybe like two years. Okay. Did you have any talking um, therapy at all during any of this? Oh, yeah. Ever? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I still see a therapist to this day. I've never not seen somebody since being released from the adult psychiatric unit. Never okay. stopped. And before that, had you, other than the gender clinic and at the gender clinic, did you have any kind of talking part therapy mm -hmm. kind of stuff? Yeah. Yes. Um, I had a therapist when I was uh, 15, um, but she wasn't, ooh, my light just died. <laughs> Is that okay? It's fine. Okay. Well, my therapist wasn't a gender therapist. She was just a, um, a traditional therapist. She was elderly. And, and then I saw a um, psychiatrist who also was not any type of gender psychiatrist, and he was not helpful at all. <laughs> yeah, I saw him once, and he told me that I was a boy who wanted to play the role of a woman in a relationship with a straight hetero, a straight masculine male. Yeah. So after, after the incident coming off, you're going to therapy, do you start working on this thing that you've brought up called self-actualization at that point? Did you start wondering, who am I? Where do I go? What do I do? At 26? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was obsessed with self-actualization. Like okay. I knew as all I wanted. I just wanted to be a real member of society, like a person with self-worth, a person who, you know, I didn't want to be miserable anymore and, and reliant on everybody to, what's the word, um, validate me. And I got a job, you know, not the best job. <laughs> I, I um, got a I went on dates with guys and was honest about my past and started to, you know, participate in the world. And then I got a boyfriend and we moved out and made, you know, have a house together and a life together. So yeah, I, I feel like I've now self-actualized. Huh. Yeah. So four the last four years, we're talking about <laughs> yes. 30 now, yes, 26. Yes. Yes, starting at 26, yes. You still trolling I, on the internet? Yes, I unfortunately, okay. you can never take, I guess you can take, no, that doesn't make any sense. You can take me out of the troll, but you can't take the troll out of me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I will still post, I will still I'll post things on Twitter. Like, I hate men so much. Like, all they care about is like, all they care about is like finding a healthy relationship and like, you know, treating me like kindly and gently and i hate them like it's the patriarchy <laughs> or yeah men only want one thing and like they want a healthy relationship and it's disgusting like things like that <laughs> like, yeah. i like to troll like that and or make up stories like <laughs> like <laughs> i don't even know like just mess around with my gen about troll about my gender like I went on a date with a guy and I didn't tell him I was transgender and I don't like, I'll make funny stories up. And then my mom ca called him and, and told him, by the way, um, you're actually dating a transgender. And, and, and all he called me like, yeah. <laughs> and all, yeah. he called me a, a certain word. Yeah. It was just like, I'll say things like that. just It's just trolling. Yeah, it's being yeah. silly. What do you think about the transgender movement or the transgender era that we've entered into now? Like this, like one, this leftist one that we're in? <laughs> like well, I mean, it's not leftist. It's the regime. It's, it's everywhere. It's on every, it's, the flag is carried up mountains by our soldiers now, right? So, <laughs> okay, let's say cultural Marxist. Okay, let's say that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's just say critical, this critical gender the deconstruction of gender 
Yeah. It's absolutely unbelievable. Like it's, it doesn't, it's insane to me. Like genuinely it's crazy. Um, Cause like when I was transitioning, there was a sense that like I was in, there weren't like many people like me <laughs> and that this was like a very medical thing in a way, maybe not medical, maybe psychological, I'll say. And like, I knew I wasn't a real woman. I knew it. Like, it wasn't like a, there was no disillusion or illusion rather. There was no illusion that I was a woman who was like a real woman. And there was no dogmatic, there was no dogmatic, there was no dogma, like religious dogma, like trans women are women. Yes, queen, like that stuff. <laughs> there was no like, gender is entirely a social construct and you know you just need to perform womanhood and that was it's just i don't understand it it's just crazy did you ever have to perform womanhood perfect your um, wrist movements uh work on your voice uh <laughs> yes 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 oh well yes like like i could like my voice I've probably talked in a more, my more real voice, this podcast, like, but sometimes I'll talk like up here, or, like, oh. I try to soften my voice or like stuff like that. Like, um, and that is more a performative thing, but I think women do that in general. Like, come on. Like if a woman's talking to an attractive guy, she's not going to like talk like she talks with her friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like she'll act more yeah. like hi like how are you and like la 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 and well, okay that's a little misogynistic sorry but um <laughs> well guys do it the, too Suck yeah, guys get all again. like yeah <laughs> hey, ladies yes, they get all like, how how do you <laughs> <laughs> well, i don't know if we do that so much yeah. anymore but they put their thumbs in their belt belt buck encroach on my space and oh my goodness no um and uh <laughs> help you with heavy yeah, objects so, terror over you I hated it. <laughs> so oppressive how men like wanna wanna help me. <laughs> and, uh, and uh yeah, so I let me think. Yeah, there's there's a little performative to it. There's like wearing a dress, it's a little performative, it's like fun. Or like but that's what everybody does. Like it's fun. Gender something you should work have fun with and play with. Or that's what I say, yeah. Well, I love it. It's true. Like, you know, you only live once, as cliche as that is. Do I, I don't want to be like some like, okay, I don't want to be like some androgynous, boring person <laughs> who's not having fun with it. Like, the dimorphism is fun. Hmm. It's fun to play into those roles and let a man hold the door for me and say, thank you so much. And yeah. let my boyfriend buy me a gift and receive that in a graceful, feminine way. Yeah. Yeah. What about the... Uh... So obviously you honor the feminine and the female. And mm -hmm. one aspect of the current trans misogyny or mm -hmm. the misogyny within uh, certain internet communities spilling out into the real mm -hmm. world is this appropriation of womanhood and, uh, you know, up to and including putting frozen tomato juice in, in your pouch to simulate a <laughs> menstrual cycle. I'm sorry to bring that up, but I, th there's that, that disgusting part and that fetishization part, but there's also just this disrespect of the female reproductive uh, cycle and the power of procreation. And so I'm just wondering like how you've, uh, what you, what your thoughts of women are and your relationship to womanhood. Well, there definitely has been a desecration of both gender genders, both sexes. Um, as in men can't be men are for their classic masculine traits are told that they're essentially oppressive and that they're toxic. And women are definitely, there's definitely been a desecration of what, what a woman is. Um, but the stuff like the period, <laughs> that whole 
stuff is like probably like two people in the world <laughs> and like okay fair enough yeah <laughs> well, and yeah like, you know i'm 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 kind of <laughs> neck deep in gc twitter so i see all the horror stories and it can get uh, overrepresented <laughs> but there's some weird stuff yeah. going on yeah definitely like i mean there's definitely weird stuff like specifically men men and women's sports is the weirdest thing um, because it is the most un indefensible, the most completely ludicrous position to try to actually take it, take a stance on of supporting, like there are no legs to stand on and they will still die on that hill. These people, they'll still say like at six foot eight dude with big shoulders and uh, who's a man, if he takes hormones for like a year <laughs> after puberty, like no, like the, the science says that he's like, he can participate now and it's totally fair. And it's just like, I have eyes, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the sky is blue, a giant six foot eight dude is a man still, if he takes hormones, he still has an advantage. And um, that's the weird thing. It's that they expect, they want, that they expect you to pretty much believe things that make zero sense. And just to like accept it and not fight it, it's really creepy. Like women, I throughout all history, there it was about motherhood, and now we're told that, you know, what are we told that birthing people? Yeah, <laughs> menstruators. Yeah, uterus havers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Exactly. It's just insane it's like the complete dissolution and deconstruction of what was once like the most ha boring thing to say like hey did you know someone who gives like birth is like a woman and like that's what women do and now it's like um you know like men can give birth too like <laughs> yeah etc what's your relationship to being a trans woman so you, you you've manifested the female to such a degree that nobody would know unless somebody told them right and then well, child child <laughs> childbirth right like to to become a woman but to not be able to fulfill that part of womanhood oh like how does that wait like what how what's my relationship with that yeah uh, was there mourning or did it ever cross your oh, mind yeah. is it something you want it's that is actually the most painful, like the most devastating thing in the world for me. Um, I'm not under any illusion. Like I know there was never, I never could have been a woman who could give birth ever. Um, the only thing I could have been was a father if I wanted children. And not being able to have kids is um, painful. It's extremely painful because I've wanted kids since I was like, 15. <laughs> like I've always loved young children and babies and um, stuff like and just nurturing them. And that's extremely painful that essentially I gave up, I gave up the chance to reproduce for essentially like, I don't know what I'd call it. Being a woman. <laughs> looking like a woman like being able to have a relationship with men um feeling like you know lessening the dysphoria yeah. but on over time that really weighs on me because what really matters like to me what really matters is having a family more than anything yeah. so i guess but like i know that i am not i know i am not a woman <laughs> I'm under no illusion, as I keep saying. It's just that I really genuinely do feel like I am a woman in mm. terms of I feel extremely feminine. And I feel as though when people say she and her and when they just see me as a woman, it doesn't it doesn't feel wrong. It feels right. It doesn't cause me any distress like dysphoria did. What about your relationship to this thing that you've called dys dysphoria? Have you managed that? Put it in a bottle? 
just disappeared it, unlived it. Put it in a bottle, you say. Like, <laughs> what, 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 what do you mean what, by that? What does one do with dysphoria, a persistent discongruence with oh. your body? Well, essentially, in there's something called dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT for people. It's it was developed for people with borderline personality disorder, and dysphoria is almost like a severe cognitive distortion in a way. Just on one hand, you could look at it that way. Like some people will say, "No, I have a woman's soul," and blah blah blah. But um, there's a sort of distortion where you're not accepting reality. I'm like, it's so in DBT, radical acceptance is something that you're taught. You pretty much radically accept the truth. You radically accept reality as it is. And I've radically accepted that I am not a real woman. And that, you know, it's nothing to get hung about. It's nothing to get upset about. It's just something to... I guess what really hurt me before was kind of this, um, what's it called, cognitive dissonance, fighting in my head, like, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. And I still feel dysphoric. Like, I still, if someone points out, you know, on, online, if someone leaves a rude comment, like, he's a man, or, um, sorry, but I just can't think of you as a woman, like, comments like that, they're, they still can hurt me a little bit depending on how just how rude somebody is and may kind of trigger dysphoria a little bit yeah yeah but you're getting better at <laughs> keeping your locus of control yours yeah yeah like i it took me it's when when i started my youtube channel that's what taught me that literally everybody has an opinion and the wrongest people are the ones who know they're right no, they're right. Yeah. It's hilarious. And it almost makes you take everybody less seriously. Yeah. It's like I've had people in my comment section say, This person isn't re this person isn't really transgender. This is an XY woman, an XX woman, and she's just riding trolling. this grift. Oh. What'd you say? Trolling. No, these people are legit. Like, no, they're, no, they're saying that you're that just people. trolling. You're just a woman trolling. Yeah, like she's it? just yeah. she's a right wing troll. Like, you know that, blah blah blah. And then and that's just hilarious. And then I have people say, you know, this guy doesn't really look like this in real life. He's using a beauty filter and, <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, people just getting really good with these uh, feminization filters. <laughs> well, I think that's a compliment. Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. No, um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it's just people really just, they're crazy. Like, people are kind of crazy. Like, and, and they're anonymous too, so they're they're allowed to be. Oh yeah, like so. One person will say you're beautiful, and the next comment will say you are the ugliest woman I have ever seen. And you know, <laughs> it's like it's genuinely funny because it shows that both criticism and compliments are words in the wind. They're just yeah. they're nothing. They're they're nice sometimes to hear compliments, but they, in the end, they don't mean anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, unless criticism is a pointer, um, you know, a tip or a trick to become better um, rather than just a judgment or a label on you, it's really not valuable. And a compliment is nice, but it's not really valuable unless there's an idea there or like, a, like indicating that, oh, okay, it's, it's good when I'm like this. And it's good when I'm like that, you know, as signals, they have value, but. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, criticism is definitely useful, but a lot of the online criticism isn't meant to help you um, improve as a human being. Hmm. It's meant to, uh, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody called me a vomit interviewer uh, yesterday. I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not to. I've seen people call you a oh, misogynist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, sorry, no, I am. I'm, I'm very misogynistic. That's what I am. You're, you're also, yeah, you're, you're a trans misogynist too. But no, no, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm all of the bad things. I'm the, I'm the biggest bigot on the block. <laughs> oh. Where are you headed now? What's the future? 
What is the future? Oh my goodness, that's what a is really... the future? Yeah, for you. <laughs> what does the future future hold? I wonder. Um, um, I don't know. I know what I want. I want to adopt a child with my to be husband, and I want to keep making keep making videos, but actually make good videos, um, not crappy ones. And <laughs> how do you do that? I... Tell me. I need to know. <laughs> How do I do? I'll make good videos. Trust How does me. one make that good advi- videos as opposed to bad? That videos? advice would be so lost on you, Benjamin. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, frankly, it's just a video that, like, I really talk about something that is, um, like, that I find interesting, and it's more than two minutes long, or five minutes, or <laughs> or I actually write a script and read the script. Though, yeah, that's that's the mark of a good video to me. Okay. Yeah. I never script my videos, but we'll pass that over. Um, <laughs> that's why I don't do them anymore. Um, I don't even script these interviews. Uh, what? You don't say no. I mean, that's that's normal, probably. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, it's not. But um, oh, <laughs> what would you be interested in speaking about or speaking to then? What What do you think right now is like the topic of interest or what you want to bring to the world? Well, there's something I talk about in my private life, and I've probably posted on Twitter if anyone sees that, but um, it's just I want radically free speech. <laughs> like, that is the scariest thing to me right now. That's like the most impressing issue right now. Yeah. That you can't, like, people will say, what do you mean? Your free speech isn't being, like, uh stomped on you can say whatever you want and like i've heard heard leftists say stuff like that or wokeists or whatever and it's just not true it's scary that like let's say like i'll just be honest let's say kanye west (laughs) like i don't want people who say quote like abhorrent things to be banned like if someone wants to call me the ugliest tranny in the world who is a man with XY chromosomes. I'll just, I'm like, you go girl. Like <laughs> you exercise that free speech. Yeah. And I just want, I want to kind of foster, I want to show people that like some transgender people can take it. Like, I guess you, and it's okay to say what those horrible, horrible things that you want to say to me. And I think it's, good that you say those that you're allowed to say those mean horrible things yeah well speaking of that you you can't really get in the bosom of the gc uh crowd and you can't be in the bosom of the trans rights activist crowd so where do you find yourself and i guess all identities now are default political um being a woman's political being a man's political, being a white or black or uh, Hispanic person, it's political. Mm-hmm. So being, tr- but being trans is hyper political right now. It's the most political thing you could be, other than a minor attracted person, might be more, even more political. We'll see, but that's still another ten years in the future. Sorry to bring that up. Let's not go down there. <laughs> but your your so not only being a woman and being perceived as a woman. Um, it's a very social, it's a, it's a social interaction and it has a lot of power and you've, it seems like you've grown a lot around allowing it, you to control it rather than it controlling you. But being trans is a political category now. And if you're going to go out there and speak about it, it's a political, you're bringing your personal life into the political domain. And how do you do that? How do you find friends? Who do you connect with? Who do you feel at home with? Like what, what is your role in that? If you want to get intentional about that. I do want to get intentional about that. Cause I want to be intentional about everything. Um, mm. I don't really know what being intentional means, but, um, yeah. the <laughs> sneeze right now, so, start crying tears. Oh my God. Like <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so oppressed my whole life. Like, Oh my God. Like <laughs> Anyway, I, uh, so okay so it is really hard it's really difficult is being like this pariah of everything (laughs) it's like 
right wing people will straight up be like, you are a man. <laughs> and left wing turfs will say, you are a man. <laughs> and just it's like they should hang out and be friends. Well, they'll, they'll be all in the comments agreeing with each other. I promise you that. Oh, no, I'm scared. If this is if this is ever on YouTube, hi everybody. Um, but I'm a little scared of that. But um, no, I, it's it's just like I kind of find it so amazing, enlightening, and enriching. Like putting myself in the line of fire is just it's so meaningful. And huh. like I mean that it is so meaningful. Like. It's amazing that I can, like, all these people are going to attack me. And it's amazingly self-actualizing. Okay. It's amazing. Like, it makes me stronger. Like, if you've ever watched Dragon Ball Z, like, it makes me more of a Super Saiyan. And, um, and, uh, the, uh, the, no, it's, but it, it is hard sometimes because, like, 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 I'll post on a conservative thing and people will literally say you're a man you're a man and then block me like conservatives like even though i agree with like a lot of what they say yeah they still lash out at me and reject me <sighs> yeah and it's it is hurtful um I have, and, a, I have a transgender friend and mm -hmm. they're very aware of my work um <laughs> especially with the detransitioner stuff and mm -hmm. uh We talk about it. They're like, children who are trans should be allowed to be transitioned because it's their responsibility mm -hmm. and they'll sort it out later on down the line. Mm -hmm. And I understand that reasoning for certain cases, but until we have proof and until it's not popular, if it wasn't popular, it wouldn't be so political. If, if it wasn't popular, if 30% of kids weren't identifying as queer, trans, and LGB, which is just an insane number. If that wasn't going on, it would be a different conversation. People probably wouldn't be blocking you if it was an anomaly and they could understand that this is a very small thing that's not going to disrupt the social order, which massively sterilizing an entire generation under the idea of gender is a big deal. Whether it's the good thing to do or the bad thing to do, it's a huge deal. So mm -hmm. being associated with that just in your identity and going through that process is violating from a conservative point of view those categories and leading to the disru disruption and crumbling of society as we know it from a conservative mm -hmm. point of view. So <laughs> I understand their point of view. And that's kind of what I tell my friend is that if it, until it's not popular anymore and until we have better data on how to you know, identify what is trans. Cause I don't even know if that category is real or not. There's people who transitioned, but are you, were you always a trans person? And I, I'm open to hearing your point of view on that, but I still have a lot of skepticism around that category. On trans kids, kind of that whole thing you want to know yeah. about what I think about that. Yeah. Well, that is one of the hardest most painful things to talk about because I really don't like, I don't like infringing on people. I hate the idea of telling people this is wrong and this is right. Yeah. Um, in certain ways. And it's a social contagion. Absolutely. Like, obviously, like how much, not, if we can talk about eating disorders, how much did we hear about eating disorders, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago and girls specifically are, Unbel there's like a biological thing of females that they are socially impressionable i would say yeah, it's called uh, in which they and there's uh, an anchor bias too yeah. co i've never heard of that co-rumination yeah. well okay so yeah so it makes sense they kind of they co-ruminate a thing about, about things and like if you ever been to a concert all the girls are screaming like it's like a cult and yeah. if you go to and it, like eating disorders like the comments will be like oh my gosh i wish i looked like her like i hate i hate myself so much and it's like oh my god like this is crazy like and um so with the trans thing it's just another contagion and there's a whole theory about like I think her name's Camille Paglia or something talks about like the end of a, an empire there's decadence yeah. and that 
there is always a, a de destru destruction or a dissolution of the gender roles the in that decadence that's a whole nother topic but i'm just saying there's this there's it's so difficult to know what really this is is it all from propaganda is it just a, like an, a phase that will just blow by and is it something that a huge amount of people will regret and be suing people over you know but i don't think tra i okay would i have been happy to transition as a child yes i'll be honest yes i would have but do i think it's actually morally right to transition a child no huh. no i don't i don't think it's good for society like that's the thing a lot of we we have so much freedom now and freedom's good but is it really freedom is that really a human right to well, okay. Let, let's transition it. your yeah. child? Well, no, for you, <laughs> would you be willing to sacrifice your secondary female characteristics for mm -hmm. society? Let's just say, let's, let's blow it out of proportion and say that, would you sacrifice yourself, your identity, and, and take a really hard path towards self-acceptance by going through the male puberty if it helped and kept society stable would you do that yes yep 100 percent, without a doubt and i only answer that question so assuredly because i've discussed this exact topic with people before that i don't care about myself in terms of society is like a living breathing thing and it needs like a healthiness to it it needs it if i could and I've said before, I would be willing to <laughs> like, yes, I would be completely willing to give up my transition if it meant that I could stop this dogma, this like cruelty, this insanity in a heartbeat. It would suck. It would really suck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I could live with it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I could live with it if you gave me enough uh, anti-psychotic. <laughs> oh, ouch! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a big that's a big thing to think through. Like, to what degree it, it is. Are, are any of us willing to sacrifice ourselves for the the greater good? The greater good, yeah. Well, yeah. people always. The problem with people now is that everything is like so personal. Like, if someone detransitions, transgender people get offended, and not all transgender people. But I see people being yeah. like, "Um, excuse me, sweetie, but that's just that just, your story doesn't reflect me, yeah. and um, yeah, that's just that's your problem now, sweetie." Like this passive aggressive, just lashing out at people because they have a different story or perspective than you and it's like this disgusting like how do i say it like they want you to be a certain role or if it if it reflects poorly on them it's like a tribalism or it's like a yeah. power thing the detransitioners like take power away from the the that what is that word the story the the what do we call it that that ideology or whatever and that's a, that's a tangent. I just mean that um, people take things too personally now. Like, it's not all about you. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> not, about... not only is the personal political, but the political is personal, right? So it's the whole loop. We're just lost in this. Everything's over power and, and uh, uh, suppressing certain narratives and, and heightening other narratives in order to get your will done, and, yeah. which, which is just human nature, right? <laughs> I don't think we've invented it, that in modernity. I think we've always done that. Well, on huh? one hand, we didn't have social media. So I kind of disagree with you because if you go out, if I talk, like if you go out in the real world, people yeah. are generally like really like, they don't really have extreme opinions. I mean, like you're right. It's not, it's, it is a humanity thing, but it's humanity combined with this really weird rat experiment <laughs> yeah yeah it's highly amplified but at the same time you still struggle with your small community and you know, yes definitely that. it's just yes there's just so much 
there's so much like it's all about power now and there's so little good faith there's so much there's so much bad faith there's so much you know i don't it pearl clutching there's so much pearl clutching (laughs) just oh my gosh that is so offensive like i'm gonna tweet all about it (laughs) like i'm so offended right now like that (laughs) i've been that whole thing i've i've done that and that's been done to me oh Um, do you have any (laughs) regret about transition yes i do i do have regret i regret that i was never given the chance to self-actualize as like a male and like like i think my dysphoria would have honestly I don't think it would have disappeared, but I think I would have, like by 26 or seven, I think I could have had a hold on my dysphoria. Like that it's it's so with me, but it's like, it's managed. Like it's like, it's not real, it's a distortion. Mm. I mean, it's not real as in like, it's not a physical thing. Um, and so I definitely regret that. Like I, but like, I'm not, upset that I transitioned. I'm, I'm genuinely not. I like my life. And I like the opportunity of being able to like, I guess, open people's minds and <laughs> close people's minds. <laughs> but um, the I do regret uh, not being able to have children too. Yeah, yeah. that hurts. <laughs> so if you could go, if you had a time machine, and you could throw one book through this time machine and, <laughs> and, and knock yourself over the head at 14, would it be like DBT? Or oh, Jordan it would Peter. be are men, bringing... men are from Mars, women are from Venus. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be no. It would be, it would be like uh, I don't even know the Bible. Just kidding. I don't. <laughs> maybe oh, I mean, like a book because it's it sounds like what you're saying is that, and and I I I say this with all due respect. Listening to your story, it sounds like you have had some sort of borderline personality issues around now, around personal boundaries and if you could go thought. back and help yourself like give mm-hmm. yourself some tools if mm-hmm. different psychological tools were available to you in order to self actualize uh i don't know what book i don't really read many books i've read like anna karenina and like books like that but uh, I think I would have sent my therapist back in time, honestly. Okay. That's like, I would have sent her, you know, you can deal with this. <laughs> and, um, uh, I first, I also, I agree with you about the borderline thing. Um, I don't have borderline BPD. I don't, I'm too mentally stable. Um, and now I have a real sense of self. Um, and, but I definitely had a lack of self-actualization from 14 to 20 because I didn't have any so meaningful socialization. Um, but uh, yeah, I it would be cool to go back in time and see with my therapist that I sent back in time if I could understand that this this too would pass or this is something that is manageable and y- you know you're magically thinking about everything this is magical thinking you know this isn't sailor moon or like that's a whole nother story (laughs) this isn't (laughs) you saved the anime to the very end of the interview (laughs) yes well anime me (laughs) what what is anime anime made me anime made me trans (laughs) it's true (laughs) well i was fine i was fine i was wondering about that oh no it's 100 percent true like oh. this is really scary it's like okay so there was never not? no no benjamin oh, you're being serious i promise okay. like i okay. yes i'm being sincere trust me i control huh. you no um the uh the so i loved anime when i was like six like six like sailor moon and just everything yeah tension moyo blah blah pokemon blah, whatever Gem. um <laughs> that's not anime that's a canadian cartoon oh okay and I didn't know about Gem till I was like 18. But anyway, um, I'm not that old, okay? Um, the uh, the so anyway, I like loved like the idea of being like, like ultra like girly, like where like being able to like transform into like a magical girl sailor scout and like be just so beautiful and like femininity in anime is so much cooler than femininity in real life. <laughs> it's stylized. 
<laughs> so I always say that if like those extreme representations of like femininity, like were sear seared into my mind. Okay. Like, yeah. So anime made me trans. No. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there is, um, we, we don't, I, when we, when we go back to the, when we talk about religious thinking and the need for religion and whether or not human beings can exist with religion or not religion, um, one way that I think about it is that when you are hanging out with a three-year-old, four-year-old, a kid, you, you Mm -hmm. Tell them stories and you see, and if you remember that part of your life, you're seeing things through like a cartoonish lens. Things are very mm -hmm. potent and, and not well-defined, but well, actually well-defined in a cartoonish sense. Everything's iconic. Everything is filled with symbolism and power. And that's just that kind of religious thinking. And so cartoons, Muppets, stories... <laughs> They are, they're the software that, you know, that human, that consciousness basically runs on. And yes. in, in those formative years, what, what kids are exposed to, it bakes their brain. That's the, that's the original, like that's the kernel level of the software. It's all the mythology and the cartoons and those stories and stuff. So I don't think we really, uh, I think that whether or not religion is something to believe in or not to believe in, I think we have to be more responsible with media's impact on children and not just like GTA is going to make you shoot up a, you know, a nightclub or something like that. I'm, I'm talking about this, the way of thinking. And so the anime way of thinking about womanhood, I can see that in a way it is, you know, trans, Transitious. <laughs> no way. It's extremely transitious. Extremely. Like, no, I mean that unironically. Like, huh. it's like, like, there's something called the Jungian, Jungian archetypes. And yeah. like, Jung, Jungian. I'm sorry, Jungian. It's um, not pretentious to um, say it correctly. <laughs> now, if I was correcting Nietzsche or Nietzsche, that would be a little bit more pretentious. But come on, you're a Petersonian. You know, it's Jungian. Excuse me, it's Nietzsche. No, <laughs> you, no, Nietzsche. you're. I, don't, I actually don't know. And yeah, it's Nietzsche. It's a privet. No, um, that's good. But um, anyway, oh, obrigada. No, um, anyway, um, I'll stop. Um, the uh, anime definitely. I mean, just the like there are archetypes. I think that we all understand from like a primal level. Yeah. That um, some people would deny because it's like transphobic or like misogynistic and stuff. But um, the we have a, I think we have an understanding of these basic roles in a story, like the lover, the fool, <laughs> the, king, the the ruler, the or the tyrant, the blah 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 blah. And maybe anime does have like an exaggerated version of some of these stories. Like Anne of Green Gables is like she's like a nice girl, but like Sailor Moon, like come on, <laughs> like powerful and divine yeah she's like the divine feminine that yeah. from faust she is <laughs> she is, like these anime girls it's just like, like and we've seen like these dudes with anime girl profile pictures and it's like they like i don't know if it's in an autogynophilic way or like in a homosexual <laughs> like from the blanchard way if if what they're picking that profile picture from i just know it's weird <laughs> it's too weird. It's is like, it weirder than having an anime pillow to sleep with to like actually become the anime uh, through the profile pic? Or is it all weird? It is all weird. I'm sorry. You, if you have an anime profile, I mean pillow, Benjamin, garbage. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> garbage know. right now. Yeah. I know. I know. No, it's all. It is all bizarre. It's all like the worshiping the feminine, but it's like not a real feminine. It's like the huh. exaggerated feminine. And anime girls are replacing women. No, um, <laughs> no, kind of. But um, it's like there's an extreme femininity to it that I think, me, like Jordan Peterson says, men worship the image of a beautiful woman. Like look at statues, look at paintings. Look at, at movies and the actresses and stuff. Men, or like Alfred Hitchcock, like look at men worship 
the image of a beautiful woman. And when you give them anime, I don't know the psychological effects of that. Like that extreme, like exaggerated, twisted femininity. Yeah. I don't know. And I don't know what it did to me. The... The relationship, I don't know, I don't, this, this is interesting because not all homosexuals are like all homosexuals, not all heterosexuals like heterosexuals, but I, one would, if you're not physically attracted to women, but you want to be a woman, right? If you don't, uh, if there's no sexual compulsion, but there's still a deep emotional drive uh, to possess and embody that, I guess. It's just like, th there's a lot there. To think about, I guess. Yeah. But like, I would like to know exactly what you're getting at. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it goes back to the Blanch, uh, Blanchardian uh, <laughs> way of thinking. There's homosexual, transsexuals, and then autogonophiles. Mm -hmm. There's a different relationship to worshiping the divine feminine from the point of view mm -hmm. of a homosexual male or a male that's not mm -hmm. sexually attracted to the woman and to the heterosexual male. And I guess I go, I'm just, for some reason, I keep on thinking of like Mother Mary and how uh, Mary was perpetuated throughout a very large chunk of our history and how that was an mm -hmm. anchor both for, for, for all men and all women. Like this is the ideal, this is the position, this is the div divine feminine and the, the anchor around which Christ is born and dies, right? She, she's the, the standard bearer for humanity mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think there's any it's... anime uh, Bible stories, but there probably are. <laughs> there's probably an anime Jesus out there somewhere with anime Mary. Well, uh, yeah, Mary was and is still a very, she represents the feminine in a very, I guess, chest or chaste way. I don't know how to say it. In a very traditional way, other than being a virgin mother. That's kind of strange. Um, but um, it's a mystery. The, uh, <laughs> mystery, yeah. Um, but, sorry. But, um, the, I don't know how, exactly how, I just, I don't know, really. I don't know like if there's a sexual element to wanting to embody a woman, if that's what you're trying to say. For you. Or like a, a, a perverse. No, no, like for me, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't, I'm not attracted to women. Yeah. I see women as just my sisters and my friends or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm only attracted to men, but I don't know if there's a sexual element to it as in like, I want to attract only heterosexual men. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, what if I really almost worshiped the idea of heterosexuality and heteronormative relationships. That's how I think of it more. So I couldn't play, I couldn't be in a heterosexual relationship that I wanted to be in if I had to play the role of a man who was into women. Um, I had, I could only play the role of a straight woman w with my sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I see it. And Maybe, you found a good guy. I mean, I think he's an amazing guy. Um, yeah, but <laughs> everyone has their own opinions, like about if that's like if he's normal for dating a tranny and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know if that word is going to get the, the video. Oh, I'm sorry. I just don't Rather, know. A, a transsexual woman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Just take that voice clip and put it over <laughs> where I. S It'll sound very unnatural. But yeah, if. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so that's all very complex and weird. And <laughs> so, do you want people to know where your YouTube is or just your Twitter? How, what, what are your socials that will be linked in the description below? My Facebook is my social security. No, um, I know on my own. My YouTube account is Rachel Richards. I think you can find it like that. Just type. It's all like one word. Um, and my Twitter, I think, is Rachel Richards. But Rachel Richards was taken, so I took the L in Rachel and put a capital I. Okay. I mean a lower a um a capital I. So it's probably like yeah. But if you just type in Rachel Richards and 
So I have a link to my YouTube bio. There you yeah, go. people people but, don't even need to type it because there'll be links <laughs> in the description where all you have to do is click it. Yeah, and if um, if you like my YouTube comment, you won't like my Twitter content. You just oh, won't. really? I'm I'm yeah, because I'm just a total troll. On Twitter and or I, YouTube or both? <laughs> Twitter. Okay, Twitter. but you, you're you're chased of trolling on YouTube. You're <laughs> totally authentic. Yes, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very chased, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I'm a born again, non-troll, non-troll. Christian woman. <laughs> Did you study languages? Or are you just good at accents? No, I'm just good at accents because I really like like I can speak a little Japanese because I embody Sailor Moon and that's a joke. Um, I can speak a little Japanese like Arigato gozaimasu, like a uh, Zankoku na Tenshi, Benjamin san, um, <laughs> like that. Or uh, I learn it from video games mostly, like a, a French, like a personne échappe mon regard, like a bonjour, like a stuff like that. And then yeah, huh. um, yeah, and uh, I did learn a little German from. Um, World War II class, but I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, but, um, it's heavy stuff. I'm reading about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, and yeah, but no, I didn't study languages like in school. I just hmm. really like language. I like verbal stuff. Did you ever think about doing voice work? Yes, actually, I games? have been asked. Yes, I have been asked to do things like that. Um, by But mostly by unserious people. So oh. I always like... Yeah, and I practice all the time, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, like I've thought of that, like, you know, play the role of like a, not like a really girly feminine person, but like I could play like role of transgender characters because they're like all the rage right now. And they are. I can, it's diversity oh, and inclusion. My fiance's home, I think. So. I'm so well, sorry, Benjamin. No, it's good. We, okay. uh, we'll let the dog end us. Rachel, thank you for your time. Thanks for for telling your story <laughs> too. <laughs> You're welcome, Benjamin. I, I we should end it. <laughs> All right, we're good. We're off the air. <laughs>